we got a lot on consent tonight. Has anybody, if anybody wants to pull anything off consent, please raise your hand, let me know. I'm about to, uh oh, Berkeley's shaking her head, I hope not. So uh, I wanna start reading through these. I see, uh, hold on one second. Where are you, there you are. Councilman Roconnell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I've got an item before the committee tonight, but I just wanted to check and see if the there will be committee discussion on RS-2020. There will be no committee discussion on that's deferred by rule. It has not gone before the finance director. The 1901. Oh, I apologize. It's, a, it's the first item. It's not my item. The first item, we will be discussing that. Okay, great, thanks. Well, it's not on consent. I don't know who's that's gonna- That's all I need, thanks. Okay. Seeing no other hands, I'm gonna start reading through the consent calendar, so y'all take a break. Resolution 2023-1945, Roten and Pulley approves the term of a cooperative purchasing master agreement for the purchase of rental services for storage, containers, specialty trucks, and related products and services for the Department of Water Services. 2023-1946, Roten and Pulley approves the contract between the Metropolitan Government and Ingersoll Rand for the maintenance and service of Metro Water Services equipment. 2023-1948, appropriate $75,000 in American Rescue Plan Act funds from Fund 30216 to the Nashville Voluntary Organization Active in Disasters Coalition for a pilot program to engage the community in emergency preparedness. Item number six, 2023-1943, Sepulveda, Johnston, Gamble, and others appropriates $175,200 in American Rescue Plan Act funds from Fund 30216 to the Music City Community Court to hire program navigators to connect tenants to attorneys and other community resources. 2023-1950, Gamble, Johnston, Sepulveda, and others appropriates $517,000 in American Rescue Plan Act funds from Fund 30216 to offset COVID-19 Financial Oversight Committee and staff administrative expenses and to expand the use of the existing American Rescue Plan Act funds currently allocated to public emergency response to include telework and information technology ex expenses. Number eight is not on consent. Number nine, 2023, 1952, appropriates $326,800 in American Rescue Plan Act funds from Fund 30216 to complete funding allocation to the Office of Family Safety to be used to address increased demand for therapy and services for victims of abuse, human trafficking, and interpersonal violence. Item number 10, 2023, 1953, wrote in Syracuse and Welsh, approves the grant from the Tennessee Office of Criminal Justice Program to the Metro Office of Family Safety to plan and implement a two-day conference hosting Tennessee Family Justice Center's personnel, coordinated community response teams, and Family Justice Center partner agencies to enhance interest and reach of multidisciplinary teams to reduce gaps in victim safety and offender accountability. 2023-1954, wrote in Syracuse, Hurt, and others, approves the grant from the Tennessee Department of Health to the Metro Board of Health to improve the health of citizens of Davidson County by preventing and controlling the use of tobacco and tobacco products. Number 12, 2023-1955, Broughton, Syracuse, and Welsh approves the Strengthening Public Health Infrastructure Workforce and Data Systems Grant from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to the Board Metro, Metro Board of Health to implement workforce strategies to build organizational resilience, promote employee well-being, and enhance workforce performance while focusing on building healthier communities. Item number 13, 2023-1956, Roten, Syracuse, Welsh, and others approves a grant from the Friends of Metro Animal Care and Control to the Metro Board of Health to provide funding for various programs for shelter animals. 2023-1957, wrote in Syracuse, approves Amendment 1 to the Epidemiology and Laboratory Capacity for Infectious Diseases grant from the Tennessee Department of Health to the Metro Board of Health to support all construction requirements associated with the cooler expansion project for the Office of Medical Examiner. Item number 15, wrote in Syracuse and Welsh, approves Amendment 1 to, the Nashville, to a Nashville Health Accelerator plan grant from the Centers for Cent Disease Control and Prevention to the Metro Board of Health to address social detriments of health to improve chronic disease outcomes among persons experiencing health disparities and inequities. 
Item number 17, 2023-1961, O'Connell, Taylor, Roten, and others approves an intergovernment agreement to the Tennessee Department of Transportation and the National Department of Transportation and Multimodal Infrastructure for Lighting and Signal Maintenance associated with the bicycle and pedestrian facilities on State Route 1 from 23rd Avenue North to 8th Avenue South. 2023-1962, Sepulveda, Roten, Withers, and Pulleys approves an intergovernmental agreement between the Tennessee Department of Transportation and the National Department of Transportation and Multimodal Infrastructure for Lighting and signal maintenance associated with the bicycle and pedestrian facilities on State Route 255 from Limbar Drive to near Harding Industrial Drive. Item number 19, 2023-1963, Cash O'Connell, Roten, and others approves an intergovernment agreement between the Tennessee Department of Transportation and the National Department of Transportation and Multimodal Infrastructure for lighting and signal maintenance associated with bicycle and pedestrian facilities on State Route 106 from Pierce Avenue to 19th Avenue South. 2023-1964, Wealth, Johnson, Nash, and others approves a Intergovernmental agreement between the Tennessee Department of Transportation and the National Department of Transportation and Multimodal Infrastructure for lighting and signal maintenance associated with the bicycle and pedestrian facilities on State Route 11 from Haywood Lane to McNally Drive. Item 21, 2023 1965, Roten and Pulley approves Amendment 2 to a grant between the Tennessee Department of Transportation and the National Department of Transportation and Multimodal Infrastructure to extend the term of the Nashville Complete Trips Transportation Demand Management Program. Item 22, 2023-1966 approves an in-kind grant from Rizek Building Company LLC to the Metro Board of Parks and Recreation for two new laptops and a PlayStation video gaming system for the exclusive use of the Kirkpatrick Community Center's new library program. 2023-1967, Roten, Hurt, Welsh, and Stiles approves a grant from the National Parks Foundation to the Metro Parks Board of Parks and Recreation in support of the Disabilities Program offering supervised recreational activities for ind individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Item 24, 2023-1968, Taylor wrote and Hurt approves an in-kind grant from Nashville Youth Hockey League incorporated to the Metro Board of Parks and Recreation to fund the purchase and installation of two electromech electro scoreboards in Rink B of the Centennial Sportsplex. And last one, BL 2023-1650, O'Connell, Roten, Withers, and Pulley authorizes the abandonment and conveyance by quick claim deed of approximately 0 .024 acres of excess right-of-way adjacent to 11th Avenue North and approves a performance agreement under which a WeGo transit stop will be constructed at no cost to the Metro government. Councilmember Allen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can we pull RS 2023, 1961, 1963, and 1965? 61, Seeing no other hands, get a motion on the consent calendar. Motion properly seconded. All in favor? Any opposed? You recommend the consent calendar. Moving on to the regular calendar. Item number one on your calendar is resolution 2022-1901 by Roten Johnson, Syracuse and other adopts a fund balance reserve policy, policies for the Metropolitan Government and Nashville and Davidson County. Get a motion. Moved properly, seconded. Any comments on Council Member Allen? Thank you, I just once again wanna thank the finance director for the work she put into this because we, we need it really badly. Uh, and it's just, it's just important to have an official policy that's that's much more explicit than just 5%, which is not enough. So thank you for all the work you did on this. Any other comments? Oh, Freddie, did you? Number one. Num <laughs> number one? Yeah, one I you just wanted yeah, to yeah, know. Yeah. Okay, good. Yes, Mr. Chair, I'd be, I've got a couple questions on that. Bring your question, sir. Thank You're you. Recognized. Um, I guess the first question I ask on this one is, uh, there is the 3% piece. I'd just love to understand the 
intention of how we would use the but for this 3% and just would love to hear from finance on that. You're recognized. Sure, this was um, born out of Council Member Mendez's consideration on if we get into a scenario where we need to increase or potentially decrease that policy and we don't have time, like Rome is burning, um, do we want to afford the finance director a little latitude to increase that fund balance as needed? And so I think this was an attempt to scratch that itch and hopefully um, Council Member Mendez achieve what you were hoping to achieve there. And I appreciate the flag. I think that was a good one. Councilman O'Connell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, that certainly satisfies my curiosity about that particular element. And then I think it's related to the uh, what would cause room to burn scenario where um, by whatever reason we have simply set our certified, certified tax rate too low to otherwise cover expenses. And I just, uh, I'm interested in the, okay, this, this sort of, that's the scenario for the fund balance, but it doesn't necessarily, by my reading, speak to um, a revenue policy, and I don't know if if there's a perspective from finance on on that side of this. Like this is this is fixing the the fund balance side. It's not necessarily speaking to the scenario where uh, we we light the match. Kelly, right now. Yeah, we've heard that um, a couple of times over the last couple of months, and I think the expectation is this is kind of the first step in modernizing the financial policies. I think the next one we've talked about is a forward-looking um, budget planning tool, not allowed to call it forecasting tool, that would do some of those things um, in probably a five or 10-year horizon look forward. Um, and then it, after we've kind of built that and unveiled that, and yet the hope and goal is to have that in advance of the FY24 budget recommendation to have something for you to react to, I get through budget and then look to codifying some sort of policies around that, um, hopefully in, in the summer time frame. And then the, also the next, next step in kind of the policy creation is something around um, capital planning and, and what does that look like on a more tracking and pre-planning funding, like kind of the, the more financial details that we've we've always just kind of um, set that 14% metric is our only metric. Should we be looking at other things? So um, this is kind of the first step as we just got the act for formerly CAFR out. It felt like this was the natural one in advance of budget. We'll do budget and funded capital. We'll do capital and then kind of circle back and see where we're at. So this is just step one in, in the holistic plan. Great, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Last question. I think to that point, um, from where we sit today, and obviously this is a key piece of that puzzle, um, where where we are right now in terms of ability to forecast if this is to pass and be applied, uh, based on existing commitments to commit half of all new revenue to schools and knowing what our existing cost of government is, are, are we expecting that we are in a position that if this passes to be able to at least deliver a status quo FY24 budget? Uh, I think it's a, a little premature. We collect um, revenues two to three months in arrears. So even though it's January, we really only have three or four months of, of revenue. So it's difficult to project um, what FY24 would look like. With the fund balance policy under consideration, if you were to use the most recent um, fund balance calculations, um, and time is not my friend, it's failing me a little bit, but I think we are well within the, the wheelhouse of where you expect to be on, on the need for fund balance, but it's just too early to project if 2-4 budget would, would look like revenue-wise. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Seeing no one else, oh, pardon me. Council Member Parker, you're recognized. Thank you, Chair, for the recognition, uh, even though I'm not a member of this committee. Um, and, and thanks for all y'all's hard work on this. I was able to watch a little pieces of some of those meetings and I was reading over, reviewing some documents today, um, sort of following up on Council Member O'Connell's question, just like, can you give us a sense of, for the operating funds, where these are at right now, you know, like, 
how far are we from 17? And then on the debt service side, how far are we from 50? Like, I guess what I'm, what I'm, it's, it's kind of the same question as Councilmember O'Connell had is like, are, is there gonna, are we gonna have a little bit of heartburn getting to these figures in the next budget cycle? Or, you know, um, do we need to look at phasing toward that goal or, or how, is, how is that set up? We did share the, the numbers, and again, the policy contemplates using the calculation that we include in the next year's budget. So when we file the 24 ordinance, it will have a 23 fund balance estimate, and that will be the calculation that will be used in doing this. But the most recent 22 fund balance number we have is what we shared, the, the kind of the waterfall and how it would flow. Um, and I know we shared it last time. Let's see if I have it right in front of me. So we are based on the two months reserve, we would be 31% funded. Um, so you would ex so that's more than enough in the operating fund. We are currently short on the debt service fund, but we would likely in the 24 budget include an appropriation moving funds from operating fund balance to debt service fund balance, which we our goal is to be at 50%. And I th think the number is maybe like, how um, do you remember off the top of your head? It's it's right in there. It, it might be a little short, but um, I think the expectation, and again, it's, it's early, but there will be growth, presumably in next year's budget that could kind of swallow that gap. Okay, so thank you, just to just to be clear. So you said that we're, the operating funds are like at 31 right now, and we're setting the floor at 17? Yeah. I'm, okay. I'm not sure I have the most recent deck in front of me, but I definitely, we presented it and I can just recirculate it um, when I get back to my desk. Thank you, yeah, I just I just wanted to, that, that helps, thank you. Yeah. Seeing no one else, all in favor? Any opposed? You recommend approval. <laughs> Kelly, since you have the microphone and it's still hot, uh, you had asked me uh, to let you make a couple of announcements and since you look like you're ready to talk, can you make some announcements? I can it? talk the bark off a tree. Uh, yeah, couple announcements. Um, first one, um, with mixed emotion, um, happy for him, sad for us. After an almost 30 year career, Tom Edelman has elected to retire. <laughs> Boo. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, <laughs> party of one. So starting as cash manager, serving as treasurer for decades, now as budget officer. Um, I just wanna publicly thank you for your service. I know you're not interested in, in, a, in a larger send off. Um, so congratulations to you and your family. And I'm thrilled um, to report after a national search um, that frankly um, got some really qualified candidates back. We were able to convince uh, Aaron Pratt to join us as the new budget officer. He joins us from most recently as budget officer director from Boulder County, Colorado. He served in Chicago for a little while. Um, he's from outside of Chicago and so uh, happy to have him and he's gonna absorb everything from Tom. Tom's last day is April 30th, um, but just looking forward to that. Uh, and then the second thing um, in my Fun fact, um, so I'm freakishly old, I just look very young. Uh, my first job out of college was I read uh, bond official statements and financial reports all day long. And 23 years later, they've not gotten any easier to read. Um, they're still not for the faint of heart. And I think I shared this um, with the audit committee members. So. Um, Council Member Hurt and Toombs and the Vice Mayor serve on that committee that in an effort to try and make um, the act for formerly CAFR kind of more public friendly, uh, other cities and towns have created something called the PAFR, which is the popular annual financial report, which is the document that you see in front of you. So first try, taken feedback, um, but that is what that is, is an attempt to distill the 500 pages of the CAFR into you know, 20 hopefully meaningful um, data sets. So if there's any feedback that anyone has in future uh, years, that's, that's what I was trying to create on that one. So, and I will share, it's electronically available, I just wanna get you all hard copies, so I'll, I'll send that email around as soon as we're done here.
I didn't say I'd take them. I said I would. I will. I will listen. <laughs> Thanks, Kim. That was it. Thanks. Oh, Councilmember Brad, for your recognize. Thank you, Chair, for recognizing me. Just a quick question: When you were referring to sending us this as a digital file, is this accept? Can we share, share this with our constituents as well? Yeah, it's. A, I'm going to send you the link to where it is on the finance page as well. And um, because we love an award, um, the GFOA, who we talk about a lot, um, does give an award for this document. So um, it is. Well, it's a lot easier to read. It is regimented and what kind of has to be in it and doesn't have to be in it. So um, I was being cavalier, uh, Councilmember Benedict, with your comment, but uh, we can take some edits, but some of it has to stay. And, you know, it's as digestible as I hope it can be. Thanks, Kelly, for all your work on that. All right, seeing no more questions on that. Moving on on the agenda, we are on item number four, uh, 2023-1947 Gamble, Johnston, Roten, and Toombs. Appropriates 10 million in the American Rescue Plan Act funds from fund 30216 to be allocated to neighborhood needs through a community-led participatory budgeting program. Uh, can I get a motion? Motion properly seconded. We have a proposed amendment on this. Uh, I think um, I think most of you may have it. It's um, Council Member Toombs, if you'd like to, and your name's not here, I don't know why, but it's, you, there you are, so you're thank, recognized. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I am actually, I'm not gonna move the amendment, but I did have a, a question. Oh, I apologize, did you say, um, she was barking <laughs> in my ear. Did you say you had a question? I do have a, a question about the, the resolution, but I'm not gonna move the amendment. Okay. All right, so the, we're not moving the amendment, so we need no motion and second, so um, um, we're not moving that. So and who is the question for? It's for the administration. Okay. So my question um, is in regard to, uh, I know that um, the proposed countywide uh, PB plan includes a, a vulnerability map. And if I could get some clarification on how that will be applied, and because uh, obviously I have some concern because much of my district is, 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 you know, some of the most neglected parts of town. So I'm always concerned as to how they'll be pr protected and how they will be uh, equitably included. Uh, thank you for, uh, can I speak? You're, you can always speak on this floor. <laughs> So, I said you can always speak on this floor. Well, most of the time. Okay. Well, speak. sorry, I forgot to ask for permission. That's okay. Um, thank you, Council Member, for the question. Uh, when we started uh, this process, the, the most important thing for us was to make sure that we use uh, objective data. So we reached out to planning and they recommended that we use the CDC social vulnerability index as a way to measure the people that are more vulnerable. The reason we did that is because by requirement of the American Recovery Plan, you have to actually make sure that you allocate most of the fund for people that are more vulnerable. And so there is the... On the maps that you got on the handout, the darker blue area has about 148,000 residents and uh, people that, re I mean, the, the census tracts where those people reside will get the bulk of the money. $4 million will be allocated to those areas. So any item that is on that area will be more likely to get funded because there is $4 million allocated for that area. And then as the vulnerability lowers, there will be less money for each one of those areas. So no matter what, items that are located within the highest vulnerability will be likely to get uh, selected uh, because they are, there is $4 million allocated for that area. So that was extremely important for us because we wanna make sure that we meet the federal guidelines for ARP. Uh, we have to report every spending to them, so we wanna make sure that we don't have to <laughs> Uh, send them the money back. So uh, I don't know if I answer your question, but thank you for asking. You recognize? Are you, is that all thank you, you have? Thank you, Chair. That's it. Uh -huh. <laughs> Seeing no one else, all in favor? Any opposed? You recommend approval. Thank you. 
Item number eight on your calendar, 2023-1951, Sledge, O'Connell, Parker, and others uh, appropriates a million in American Rescue Plan Act funds from fund 30216 to the Metropolitan Government to provide subsidies for electric bicycles. We had a letter from Council Member Sledge, but this is deferred by rule as the finance director has not had a chance to review this yet. So we will be back up on our next calendar. So there is no discussion on this one, so. All right, we're on item 2023-1960, Van Rees, Hancock, Roten, and others approves an intergovernmental agreement between the Tennessee Department of Transportation and the National Department of Transportation and Multimodal Infrastructure for lighting and signal maintenance associated with the bicycles and pedestrian facilities on State Route 6 from Walton Lane to Wiley Street. We have a letter to approve by uh, the sponsor. Um, get a motion moved, properly seconded. Seeing no hands, all in favor? Any opposed? You recommend approval. 13 in favor, zero against. Um, on to item number 17, RS 2023-1961, O'Connell, Taylor, Roten, and others approves an intergovernmental gr agreement. The Tennessee Department of Transportation and the National Department of Transportation and Multimodal Infrastructure for Lighting and Signal Maintenance associated with the bicycle and pedestrian facilities on State Route 1 from 23rd Avenue North to 8th Avenue South. Motion moved properly seconded seeing uh council member o'connell you are recognized thank you mr chair um well actually you know what on the budget piece i don't have any questions i'm going to save uh i've got a transportation infrastructure question i'll save for that committee thanks thank you council member for recognizing the difference between budget and transportation i always appreciate that seeing no hands all in favor any opposed you approve 13 in favor zero against Item number 19, RS 2023-1963, Cash, O'Connell, Roten, and others approves an intergovernmental agreement between the Tennessee Department of Transportation and the National Department of Transportation and Multimodal Infrastructure for lighting and signal maintenance associated with the bicycle and pedestrian facilities on State Route 106 from Pierce Avenue to 19th Avenue South. Can you get a motion? Properly moved, properly seconded. I have a hand on the front row. Council Member Allen, you are recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I had actually asked to have 61 and 63 taken off because those are adjacent to areas that I know very well. But since uh, Council Member O'Connell is going to be a purist, and I think my questions are actually more related to transportation, I will hold those questions for that. Meeting. And I'm loving you as well today. Okay, thank you very it. much. Keep the chocolate. <laughs> yeah. Um, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? 13 in favor, zero against. Item number 21, RS 2023-1965, wrote and Pulley approves Amendment 2 to a grant agreement between the Tennessee Department of Transportation and the National Department of Transportation and Multimodal Infrastructure to extend the term of the National Complete Trips Transportation Demand Management Program. Motion, motion properly seconded. Any comments, questions? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? You move for approval. <laughs> Moving on to item number 25, RS 2023-1969 authorizes the Metro Department of Law to compromise and settle the claims of Ralph Ford against the Metropolitan Government and its employees in the amount of $236 to be paid from the Judgments and Losses Fund. I get a motion. Properly seconded. Any questions on this? Seeing no questions. All in favor? Any opposed? You recommend approval. 13 in favor, zero against. Item 26 on your agenda, 2022-1571, Styles and Gamble. Bill on second reading amends Title Eight of the Metric Code of Laws relative to animals. Council Member Styles, you're recognized. Thank you, Chair. You can hear me now? Okay. Let me see if I can get a motion. Move properly, thank you. Did you recognize? I'd like to defer this to the first meeting in July. We have a, get a motion for deferral. Second. 
motion is properly seconded for deferral to the first, I apologize, what was the, when, was, when did you want that deferred to, I apologize. The first meeting in July. Okay. The council's telling me it'd probably be the sixth, is that correct? Probably. Probably the sixth is what I'm hearing, so. All right. So on the motion to defer, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? You adopt. 13 in favor, zero against. Defer to the first meeting in July. Item number 27, 2023, 1647, Henderson, Pulley, Roten, O'Connell amends various provisions of Chapter 6.104, 13.08, and 13.32 of the Metro Code relating to sidewalk vending and the clearing of obstacles from the public right way. Can I get a motion? Motion properly seconded. Council Member Allen, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I've gotten lots of emails in support of this. It seems like a great idea, but I do have a couple of questions. Uh, maybe to the administration. The, the first is, uh, because this removes is produce peddlers, our, our farmers markets dealt with somewhere else and they're still allowed in all circumstances? Margaret, do you want that or do you want? Question. Council Member Henderson, do you want to answer the questions or do you want me to call you on bet. Director Alacron? Um, I, I, I think it would be uh, fine for um, Ms. Darby or otherwise. I, I understood it to somewhat be an archaism um, and we were just uh, kind of moving that out um, in an effort not to create confusion that that was somehow a separate, um, maybe way, way back in the day at one time, um, that was a very specific use that needed to be codified. Um, but my understanding is it does not have any specific or negative implications on farmer's market or other type um, uh, uh, vending that we might uh, have seen at, at, at roadside, perhaps in some of our more rural areas. I, I don't think the removal um, in, in this uh, ordinance has a negative impact, um, but I would welcome uh, staff or Ms. Darby's uh, insight beyond that if they have some. Okay. Ms. Alacron, do you, she's like, oh, did you call on me? Yes, I did. Did, did you hear the question? Okay. So really the question is how does, does this affect farmers markets or are they regulated somewhere else? Because if they're not, it kind of sounds like it applies to them and they can only be downtown. Just checking. She's discussing back there. <laughs> yeah. I apologize, but I am gonna blame this on council member Stiles. <laughs> that's okay. For distracting me the question. Right, council member Stiles, that's one check for today, okay. <laughs> Um, so, um, I believe the question was, does this ordinance actually impact the farmer's market? The farmer's markets, market. I mean, like their own, their own public right of way. So, so, um, if it is within that boundary, yes, ma'am, they will not be able to operate within that particular territory, um, based on... They, okay, they would not be able, they would have to, they would be able to come through though and get a special permit through us that would allow them to do it. But they wouldn't be able to go through the process of getting the vendor's permit that would allow them to operate in the capacity of a sidewalk vendor. They would then have to come through the special event process and get a permit that way. Gotcha. And and so I guess what I'm asking is, are, are, are they otherwise like at Richland Park and Severe Park, are those governed by something somewhere else or not? Council Member O'Connell. nodding. Yes, Council so. Member O'Connell is raising his hand. I know okay. he's been involved in this, so we'll let him. Council Member O'Connell, you're recognized. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Council Member, for the question. I, I mean, and again, I'm, I'm not the attorney speaking to this, but from the conversation, my understanding is almost every community farmer's market that is not operated by the Nashville farmer's market uh, operates out of the parks permitting process. And so this is principally oriented toward public right of way managed and maintained by the National Department of Transportation. And so this, like I, and I will say this, I have never observed any of the community's farmer's markets operating in such a way that they um, exist on uh, sidewalks, for instance, unless it is in the context of a park context where it is permitted a, as such. Um, you know, I, I think the other question would be something along the lines, but again, there are some boundaries stipulated in here, but like, you know, the food truck scenarios on Dedrick Street, but there is a separate food truck permitting 
process as well, yep. uh, specified in the code. I believe that we have covered, Mr. Chair, uh, all the applicable scenarios that the council member has inquired about. Uh, and I would invite either Ms. Darby or uh, somebody from NDOT or the administration to, to offer something different. But that is that is my understanding from the, the briefings I've had on this. And you know, again, my familiarity with previous episodes. Thank, thank you for that. Might I have one more question? You're recognized. What, one more scenario is, does, does this affect um, vendors selling the contributor or is that covered somewhere else? That's covered elsewhere. Vendors selling Okay, that? I'm done with questions. Thank you. Councilmember O'Connell, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I have specifically uh, both interacted with the contributor uh, as well as uh, NDOT and the administration to make sure that uh, they are sufficiently protected and, and everyone believes as we come to discussion on this bill that they are appropriately protected to be able to still vend there. Thank you, council member. I see our trustees in the back of the room. Former council member, how you doing? It's good to see you. If you got any problems with your taxes, go talk to her. She's back there. So we um, we had a motion to approve, uh, properly seconded. All in favor? Any opposed? You recommend approval. Thirteen in favor, zero against. And that is the end of the calendar. So thanks all. Motion to adjourn. So moved.